My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESCCP. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research effort, efforts to develop and demonstrate different additive manufacturing approaches. First, Mr. Michael Froning from the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center and Mr. Kelsey Snidely from the University of Dayton Research Institute will talk about the use of additive manufacturing to build an efficient and cost-effective microturbine engine. Second, Dr. Deeran Apelian from the University of California, Irvine, and Dr. J. Yu Lian from Worcester Polytechnic Institute will discuss the development of an additive manufacturing enabled investment casting process to recycle metal waste from forward operating bases. Each presentation will be followed um, by um, a Q&A session and we will conclude the webinar um, with a longer Q&A session. Uh, the next two slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you cannot download Zoom, you may view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge. Uh, and you can create a free Zoom account. If you have difficulties or if your screen freezes, try keying in Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. And in case of continued technical difficulties, please download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to submit your questions. We do encourage you to get them in well ad in advance of the Q&A sessions. And we ask that when you submit your questions to please add your organization name at the end of it so that we can identify it during the Q&A sessions. We ask that you also not submit questions in the chat box. The chat box should be reserved for comments related to technical difficulties, while the Q&A box should be reserved for questions uh, for the speakers. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Lascala, who is the CERTIP and ESCCB Program Manager for Weapons Systems and Platforms. Prior to joining CERTIP and ESCCP, John served as the Chief of Manufacturing Sciences and Technology Branch in the Weapons and Materials Research, Research Directorate of the DEFCOM Army Research Lab. Throughout his career, John worked on bio-based thermosetting resins for adhesives and coatings and environmentally friendly polymers for composites, adhesives, coatings, and additive manufacturing applications. John is the recipient of numerous awards for his work on polymers, including the 2013 Presidential Green Chemistry and Energy and Engineering Challenge Award for Renewable Thermostats. He is also the recipient of the 2010 ESCCP project from the, of the year. John, we're happy to have you. Please get us started. Uh, thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. The next few slides will provide a quick overview of CERTIP and ESTCP. CERTIP and ESTCP are the, the Departments of Defense's investment in, in environment and installation energy science and technology. The programs report to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for en Energy Resilience and Optimization, headquartered at the Pentagon. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP addresses high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on the top priority DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impact real world environmental management. 
ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate and validate innovative environmental and installation energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIF or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. Next slide. Advances in sciences and science and technology provide the DOD with the tools needed to effectively manage and restore its assets to protect troops, their families, the public, and the environment. CERTIP and ESTCP investments improve installation and energy resilience and environmental cleanup. UXO remediation, resource conservation, and sustainment and maintenance of defense assets. Next slide. CERTIP and ESTCP fund, monitor, and actively guide relevant and applied research, development, testing, and evaluation projects for the DOD's top environment and installation energy challenges. Our programs currently fund over 600 active projects. To maximize research impact, CERTIP and ESTCP collaborate with top talent across sectors. We currently fund projects with 72 academic institutions, 61 federal laboratories, 16 top-ranked universities, and 43 in industry partners. Our innovation and technology development inform DOD policy to ultimately improve environment and energy ma management. Our webinar series highlights outstanding projects across all of our main focus areas. The next webinar uh, WP topic is on May 16th on sustainable aviation coatings. Registration is open for webinars through the end of this year. Um, you can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. All past webinars are archived and can be accessed using this link. Uh, with that, I'd like to remind you that a copy of today's presentation and session can be downloaded from our webinar webpage. Uh, we would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Rula to introduce today's speakers. Thank you for joining us, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the webinar. Thank you, John. Our first two speakers are uh, Mr. Michael Froning. Um, and Mr. Kelsey Snively. Mike is a technical director in the Sustainment Technology Transition Branch at the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is in Dayton, Ohio. Mike has 29 years of industry experience in addition to his um, uh, federal work here. Um, uh, he worked for General Motors and the Delphi Automated, and Delphi Automated, um, Delphi Autom Automotive, where he served in multiple senior level positions. Mike received a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Dayton, a master's degree in material science from the University of Dayton, and a, a graduate degree of engineering from the University of Florida. Uh, Mr. Snidely is a senior additive manufacturing engineer in the Sustainment Technology Transition Division at the University of Dayton Research Institute. His professional experience includes time spent in multiple industry, including automotive, aerospace, and additive manufacturing. Finally, Kelsey received a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Dayton and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Purdue University. Mike, please proceed. Okay, slide. I'm going to begin here with a uh, quick project overview. Thank you, Rula, by the way, for the kind introduction. Uh, we'll start out with a little outline here. I'm going to cover the background, why we did this project and why we pursued it. And then I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey. He's going to talk about the actual engine development and manufacturing that was done at the University of Dayton, and then talk about some of the testing that was done. Then he's going to turn it back over to me and I'll cover cost effectiveness and environmental impact. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the implementation challenges and successes. Uh, maybe you've heard the old saying, the best thing you hear about a new process or material is the first thing you hear about it. And we had a few challenges, but I think we overall uh, did a pretty good job. 
then I'll cover the conclusions and potential benefits to the D DOD. Slide, please. As a background, um, you know, it's it's still true that in the battlefield, the one that uh, flies the highest, the fastest, um, and can do the most damage both on the ground and in the air is gonna dominate. But if you've been watching the recent conflicts in the world, you've noticed that the battlefield is really evolving and rapidly, whereas the most expensive uh, hardware out there, which is usually the most capable. Now you're seeing a lot more development of smaller, less expensive things that can flood the zone with large numbers of, for instance, unmanned drones and support equipment on the ground. And those need to be developed quickly and at less cost. So we looked at this project as a way to demonstrate how you could use AM to counter some of those things and proceed much more quickly with development. Uh, to do that, we had a couple conventional paradigms that we had to overcome. And those were mainly related to AM, that we couldn't print the complex features of a micro turbine engine, that we couldn't hold the dimensional tolerances to make it work, and that the somewhat rough finish of a, an as printed surface wouldn't work in a internals of, a, of an engine. Slide. So we took a multidisciplinary approach and we, we were very excited about AM, but we also knew that we had some significant limitations. There are only some things that you can print with AM. You can't print every material, you can't print every design and every feature. So one of the things we had to do was pull together engine designers with AM experts to match our design requirements with the printability limitations. It's great to design the best engine, but if you can't print it, you don't have anything. So the final design, we used computational fluid dynamics to help model. And then we took ad, uh, advantage of AM to be able to take an iterative design approach. And I'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. For now I'm going to uh, slide, turn it over to Kelsey. Okay. Thanks Mike. And good morning again, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the technical details of the engine itself and talk about um, how we kind of came up with the engine design that we ended up with and what the manufacturing of it looked like, and then also share a little bit of the testing details. So Mike mentioned that there was a lot of computational fluid dynamics um, involved in the development of the engine, and so we wanted to show some of the evidence of that, that work. Um, this is a lot of the upfront work that went into the project um, to help us arrive at, you know, a new engine design um, and to ensure analytically that this, this new engine design that we came up with would actually function the way we wanted it to. Um, we took a very traditional approach with this. We wanted to respect, you know, the traditional, traditional engineering um, design methods um, with this. And, and so we did a lot of analysis on you know, the individual subsystems of the engine, such as the compressor up front uh, in the engine, and then as well as the, the combustion chamber, looking at things like airflow and fuel feed into the combustion chamber. Um, and then beyond that, we also did some analysis on the entire engine assembly itself, making sure that all the different subsystems would work cohesively and function exactly as we expected them to. Um, and then so with all of this upfront effort, that allowed us to arrive at this final engine design that you see here. So on the left side of the screen, you see the CAD model of the engine, and then on the right is the actual printed hardware. Now, if you're familiar with jet engines, or particularly these small types of microturbine jet engines, you'll notice that um, really our engine design isn't too far of a departure from a traditional microturbine design uh, in the sense of, you know, we've really got all the, the standard components here. So um, you can see, you know, on the left top left picture here, we, we have a starter motor for the engine and a motor mount at the inlet of the engine. And then we've got an engine housing. And within our engine housing, you know, we have that compressor section. We've got a combustion chamber in the middle and then a, an axial turbine um, on the back end of the en engine. And then as well as a nozzle on the back end of the engine that allows us to control thrust um, from the engine. 
Um, and then internal to the engine, you can see we have our spinning hardware. So we were able to consolidate that all down into one component, but that, that, that spinning hardware consisted of a compressor wheel, a drive shaft, and then a, a turbine disc. Um, now, what's special about our engine design is 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 it kind of um, you know it's simple, but it's also very complex. So it's simple in the sense that additive manufacturing really allowed us to consolidate a lot of parts. So Mike uh, mentioned on one of his early slides that you know these traditional engines have hundreds of different components that are manufactured and assembled together. Whereas with additive, additive manufacturing, we were really able to uh, consolidate a lot of parts. Um, and greatly simplify both the manufacturing and the assembly of the engine. Um, so it's just greatly reducing, um, you know, the total part count. Um, but, you know, so that's from a high level. If you look at a closer close up of the engine, and specifically in these uh, images of the printed parts, you can see there's still a lot of complexity um, with these engine components. Um, a lot of organic geometry, um, unique shapes and small delicate features, um, and even internal there are internal features um, that you can't see in these pictures. There are a lot of, um, you know, cavities and, and um, you know, tunnels through the, the housing components specifically that supported things like uh, fuel input into the combustion chamber and also allowed us to put instrumentation in different areas of the engine, which I'll talk more about um, in a few minutes. And so, yeah, just kind of summarizing, uh, this engine was really a balance between that simplicity that I talked about and and the complexity that's needed for a, a you know a complex piece of machinery like this. And so, we're really proud of this design that we were able to come up with, um, and just to be able to print it. If you know anything about metal additive manufacturing, to be able to print something like this is a huge achievement. Um, so, this was really you know uh, just a huge accomplishment early on in the program for us. Now, in terms of printing the engine hardware, um, we printed it at the Advanced Technology Training Center in Dayton, Ohio. Um, it was printed on a direct metal laser melting uh, 3D printer as a powder bed metal uh, printer, uh, specifically an EOS M290 machine, uh, which is a very commercially popular available metal printer. Um, and we used an Inconel 718 a material for most of the engine components. That Inconel 718 material is uh, very popular in the aerospace world because of its strength characteristics and uh, specifically because of those, it maintains those strength characteristics at high temperatures. Um, you know, so while our you know, engine design was very novel and unique, there's nothing terribly complicated about how we produce it. Um, there are a lot of different shots out there that we feel, you know, they have these printers or similar printers, they could take our design and recreate this, this type of engine. Now, that being said, you know, with utilizing additive manufacturing, we wanted to cut down on as much of the traditional machining um, processes um, that, you know, typically go to, into an engine like this as much as possible. Um, but we did understand that we needed to respect some of the traditional work that's done on these types of components. Um, and just one example here is the balancing of the rotational hardware. So, you can imagine um, this type of engine hardware spend, spins at tens of thousands of RPMs. Uh, any imbalances in that can lead to significant instability when the, the hardware is spinning. And so um, this is just a few images of, of how we balanced our rotational hardware. And this is done on a, uh, a balancing machine that is you know, used for uh, small engine hardware uh, like ours. So not a unique uh, machine or setup or anything like that. Um, uh, and so again, nothing too unique about how we made this, but again, just showing that we did kind of respect some of the traditional uh, methods that are, are used to produce uh, this type of engine hardware. And so, you know, all this design work um, and, uh, you know, the manufacturing and assembly of the engine that allowed us to finally be able to test an engine. And so we had a couple of different test sites that I want to talk about, and then I'll, I'll share a little bit of the test data that we were able to collect from the engine. We had two main test sites. Uh, the first was at Air Force Research Laboratory at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base here in Dayton, Ohio. Um, the small engine lab there out at wright Path, they were kind enough to let us get into their lab early on in the project and kind of do some proof of concept testing. Um, they really helped us sort out how we would set up our, our fuel systems and control systems, the electronics for the engine, 
as well as a lot of the instrumentation for the engine. And then unfortunately that lab had to go down for renovations about halfway through our program. So we had to pivot a little bit um, and we ended up kind of designing and building our own test stand for the engine. And, and we called that a mobile engine test stand. So really it was just built up on like an industrial cart. Um, but that cart, uh, it allowed us to, you know, consolidate all these uh, engine support systems and the engine mount into a mobile stand that gave us more flexibility with the testing. Um, and, and in the end, we ended up using that test cart at the ATTC there in Dayton, Ohio, where the parts were printed. So we were able to do the printing and the testing um, all at the same facility. Um, now, what, before we went and just started testing a 3D printed engine, we wanted to build some confidence in our test setup. Um, so we ended up um, using a commercially available micro turbine engine, uh, JetCat P400 specifically. Uh, it's a very popular engine in the you know large RC aircraft market. Um, and, and so we wanted to test a commercial engine and, and just verify that, yes, our test setup and measurement capabilities are working properly and that we trusted, you know, what we had built. Um, and, and so some of the main things we were trying to measure from the engine were things like thrust and um, uh, thrust specific fuel consumption, and then as well as uh, sound pressure level or noise emissions from the engine. And so we were able to collect this data from that JetCat uh, engine and then compare it back to the published data for that engine. Um, and then, uh, so that just, again, allowed us to build our confidence in the uh, uh, in our test setup that we had built. And so we did this data collection on that JetCat engine, both at the AFRL lab, uh, as well as at uh, the ATTC on our, our test stand that we had built. And so um, so beyond those things that I mentioned, uh, those the performance characteristics that we were measuring um, on that JetCat engine, we also needed to be able to measure a lot of other things on the AM engine to be able to fully assess the performance of the engine. So we needed things like static and total pressure as well as temperature um, throughout different areas of the engine. And then uh, we needed to be able to monitor our bearing temperatures as well as the engine speed reliably. And so we had to incorporate uh, ways to fit in this uh, these instruments into the different areas of the engine um, so that we could really characterize, okay, is the engine behaving the way we expected it to? Does it line up with those analytical models that we had built at the start of the project? Um, and, and really be able to assess, you know, how efficient is the engine running? And so that was a big effort to be able to incorporate um, all these different measurement points. Now, having done all that, that led us to this big moment, which was the first time we got the engine to its idle condition, uh, that is running under uh, fuel power alone and sustaining itself without any external energy input. And so that's just kind of what we're showing here. We did a quick um, like 20, 25 second run at the idle condition the first time before we ended up shutting the engine down to just do you know inspections, make sure everything looked okay. Um, but so that's you know just at a high level what we're showing with this very simple chart here. So there's, there's three lines here. The orange is the engine speed. The yellow is the starter motor power. So I talked about that starter motor that helps with starting up the engine. And then the blue line is our, our fuel feed. So you see the fuel feed is consistent here. Um, so how it worked was we were able to get the engine up to the idle speed condition, which was exactly where we expected it to be, somewhere between 30,000 and 31,000 RPM. We cut the starter motor power, so that goes to zero. And then you see with the constant fuel feed, that, that speed is maintained by the engine under its own power. So that, that shows us that the, the engine is idling under its own power. Um, so that was a really big moment for us. And, and you know, we were in some idle tests, um, you know, multiple times. And, and I mentioned we had different places where we were measuring temperatures. So all throughout the engine from the inlet to the exhaust gas, we were measuring temperatures and, and validating, yes, temperatures are in a safe operating condition. They're where we expect them to be. Uh, we're seeing temperature drops um, as we expect them to see, things like that. Uh, and same thing with our pressures. Uh, we, you know, there are pressure rises and pressure drops throughout the engine, um, and we were able to measure those and again validate that data back to the analytical model that we had developed. Uh, so just kind of showing some snapshots here of the pressures and temperatures of the idle condition. 
Now, beyond the idle condition, we were also able to test up to roughly 38,000 RPM, or what we consider about our 50% power condition. And so again, just showing a quick snapshot of what temperatures looked like um, at that condition. Again, um, temperatures are actually very similar to the idle condition, which is exactly what we wanted to see. We're not seeing um, you know, higher temperatures or temperatures get out of control as we're putting more fuel into the engine. Um, and then same thing with the pressures. Um, as you can imagine, as the engine spins up at faster speeds, that means that the pressure rises and drops change dramatically. But again, we were able to measure them and show they're stable. And also they line up with the, the analytical data that we had uh, you know, predicted beforehand. Um, and, and so, yeah, just to conclude, um, we were only ever able to test up to that 50% power condition um, and we never really, uh, unfortunately, got up to the uh, full power condition of 76,000 RPM, unfortunately, just to, due to some um, delays in, that were caused by some issues with our test stand. But um, uh, we think we're, you know, we came a long way with this engine design and, and with the tests that we were able to do. And really, you know, we're, we're proud of what we were able to show that this printed hardware could perform and it, it it performed as expected and, and was stable under those idle and low, low speed conditions. So um, from from this point on, I'm going to hand it back over to Mike and Mike's going to talk, you know, bigger picture, some of the uh, the impact of, of this testing and engine development work. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, so I'm going to move now to talk a little bit about uh, some of our conclusions and benefits that we see potentially for the DOD. And we're going to do this uh, looking at it three ways. We're going to look at the environmental impact, uh, the cost comparison, and lead time between a traditionally manufactured, or as we would call it, subtractive manufacturing method, machining, and building of an engine to an additively manufactured parts. And we're going to um, focus primarily on castings because castings tends to be one of the very long lead time items and most difficult to uh, get without multiple trials. So um, the thing about this is that when you talk about a foundry making a casting, the lead time to get the mold optimized and to actually get a good casting can take many iterations. And sometimes it can be three or four just to get your first good casting. And then if when you start to test a new design, you realize that it's not performing and you need to alter something. And if that happens to be in the casting, uh, then suddenly you've got to start all almost all over again, may just be a minor modification, but sometimes that can be back into more and more iterations. So what we're working with here is digital engineering where changing the design is changing the CAD file and turning on the printer. Now, I know that sounds, I'm making that sound very simple. It's not always uh, that simple, but we're gonna talk a little bit about, about what we believe came out of this. Now, UDRI has a very uh, good cost estimating team that's staffed by experts in uh, with industry experience and they can, can pretty much tag different processes, for instance, foundry processes for cost and lead time. So let's talk first about the environmental impact. Well, we needed something to compare to. So we went with the Pratt & Whitney TJ150, which is a small micro turbine and compared it to our engine. And we looked at this, uh, like I said, primarily as investment castings part of it. Uh, but also those castings have some uh, post-processing. In the case of a traditional casting, there's quite a bit of machining, a lot less with uh, almost none with ours AM engine. Plus between the processes, you have to do some, the machining and transport it between places and then assemble everything. Whereas for the AM engine, uh, you're talking about a gas atomized powder, 3D printed, Post-processing uh, is enabled and we picked eight iterations of this, mainly because during our development program, we ended up doing eight different iterations of the design. So we thought that was a good one. So we looked at this, if you look at the bottom uh, from the investment casting process, there are obviously things like sulfuric, 
uh, oxide, there's nitrous oxide, there's volatile emissions coming off, uh, which we don't have with the AM printing. And if you do one engine, traditionally, the kilowatt hours to do the casting, heat the furnace, and the CO2 emissions you see here. And, and then if you take that out through en eight engines, you see the difference between the total investment casting, kilowatt hours, and CO2 produced to an AM engine. Now, you could argue with the, the numbers and say, well, you know, how, how accurate are they? Well, we're talking about a four times difference here. So even if we're off a little bit, um, it's still substantial. As a cost comparison, once again, everything on the top of this slide is the same. Uh, we're talking here about the cost of the actual making the castings. And again, approximately four times difference uh, just in traditional manufacturing versus AM. Lead time? Well, the lead time, um, it's not uncommon in the casting process. I've done quite a bit of work with castings as of late, and it could be three to four tries to get a first good casting, especially if the casting has any significant detail to it. And we have to be able to hold the uh, the, the part to the dimensions we need. We need to make sure there's not holes in the casting, internal porosity, that sort of thing. So casting and foundry practices are getting better, but they're still part art. So uh, when we compare the eight tries of lead time, we're assuming here on the first one for castings that it took 20 weeks and that each one was a was after that was a little bit less, not substantially. I can tell you from my experience, I think if we have to do many iterations of a casting, the lead time on this can be uh, much more than shown here. So I think that's a, a very conservative number. And when you look at what we did and what we were able to do on our designs and rebuilds, it was pretty consistent from build to build. And once again, um, you're talking about less than half the time to do it with an AM and AM printing relative to a traditionally manufactured engine. So in conclusion, well, the DOD does need power plants, both uh, not just for aircraft, but ground support. And they need to be sourced in a cost-effective, uh, environmentally friendly manner. So this team utilized a multidisciplinary approach we um, employed computational fluid dynamics modeling. And I can tell you the final uh, performance compared very well to what we had modeled. And we used AM to get an uh, iterative design manufacturing scheme. We were able to manufacturing test all of this at the Dayton Advanced Technology and Training Center. We had an extremely complex geometry. I don't believe the pictures that you saw there really shows the, the fine detail, including all of the monitoring ports and pitot tubes and things that were printed in. The, um, those were all printed right in and didn't have to be uh, externally added except for fittings to connect. The printed components required minimal uh, traditional finish and um, from a environmental impact, we demonstrated what I think was a major reduction in manufacturing operations, decreased emissions and waste production. What are the benefits to the DOD? Well, obviously parts consolidation. It, we took this one to the extreme. We only printed uh, three or four parts, two major parts of the engine. Um, and <laughs> That was to the extreme, and we were trying to show what we could do. If you were going to do this, uh, you could always back off and make other parts of the engine and not try to do it all in the extreme, but any way you do it is going to help. Also, this reduced sourcing costs. It's, costs. it's not done um, in a bunch of different outside suppliers. It's all was done at the ATTC. We believe we've demonstrated decreased environmental emissions and waste. 
due to a major reduction in manufacturing operations, including things on subtractive manufacturing, where you end up uh, machining away a lot of the material, which ends up scrap, has to be recycled. You have all kinds of machining oil and that sort of thing. So um, we ended this, and I'm going to end this by saying that it's always good to find out whether you, you're as good as you think you are and whether you really did uh, accomplish anything of worth. And there is an additive manufacturing users group conference every year. This thing uh, in the last few years has been held in Chicago and will be another one coming up here in March. Last year, they had just short of 2000 attendees. And each year they give three awards. They give one for advanced AM concepts, they give one for AM finishing. In other words, how do you finish parts that you printed? And then they combine those two and they have a place where everybody goes in and views the, the technologies presented and they can hear from the, the people who did the work. And at the end, they vote on a member's choice award. And I am very pleased to tell you that we came away with both the advanced concepts and the, finish, and the uh, member's choice awards. And we are going to be invited or have been invited to brief at this year's AMOG conference during the plenary session. So we feel good about this project. And with that, I am going to stop talking and let people ask questions. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Kelsey. Um, just as a reminder, if you have questions, please get them into the Q&A box. We did receive a lot of questions, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started with a question for Kelsey from the Naval Sea Systems Command. Were there any issues with surface finish or surface porosity on these complex geometry parts? Yeah, so I mean, surface finish, if you're familiar with that, at metal out of manufacturing, it's always a challenge. Um, Definitely the surface finish of these components is not comparable to a traditionally machined part. Um, it's it's going to be worse, but in terms of showing whether or not it had an impact on the functionality of the engine, we did not really see any issues with the surface finish um, impacting, you know, how the engine operated, uh, at least at those low speed conditions. I mean, it might you know, as you spin up at higher um, operational speeds, the surface finish might have a detriment on some of the efficiencies within the engine. Um, but at least in the levels that we were able to test the engine, we did not see the surface finish having any uh, impact on the performance. Wonderful. This um, next question is from the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division. How do the performance metrics measured compare to a traditional built motor when you static fired a measuring idle at 50%? Uh, right, yeah, and so I showed, you know, we did take some measurements on that traditional jet cat engine. And um, un unfortunately that engine is rated for about half the thrust of what our designed engine was for. So it's not directly comparable to our engine. Um, and so, uh, we didn't want to, you know, publish our stats for our engine right next to those because it might raise some eyebrows. But once you realize they're not rated for the same uh, thrust category, you'd, you'd understand that why we would do that. But um, and so, in terms of fuel consumption and the sound pressure levels, we feel like the engine, uh, the AM engine, is comparable to like a traditional um, commercial engine. Uh, unfortunately, with us not getting to do our full power testing, we didn't really do a lot of thrust measurements because, you know, thrust is exponential as the engine speed goes up. And so the the thrust measurements at the low speeds where we tested were kind of negligible. Um, it, it wouldn't really be comparable to anything. And so, uh, yeah, there's definitely still some work to be done um, with our engine and to, to really fully characterize it and, and do some measurements uh, in terms of those performance characteristics. Thank you, Kelsey. This is a follow-up question from the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division. How do you measure and compare the porosity between traditional casting versus additive manufacturing? 
Yeah, so we do a lot of porosity measurement on the, the AM parts, um, typically through CT scanning. Um, and I can tell you that, at least in terms of, um, you know, like an investment casting, the AM parts always compare very favorably. Um, you can find published data about porosity statistics for um, AM parts that come out of these um, these laser powder bed fusion machines, but it's typically on the order of like 99.9%. Um, porosity is typically very low. Um, uh, inclusions are typically fairly rare. Um, and I think it, and it's very repeatable uh, to achieve those, those levels of porosity. So um, yeah, I think porosity for the AM parts compares very favorably to cast parts. Great, thank you. This next question is from um, Northeastern University. Did the residual stresses affect the dimensional tolerances? Yeah, for sure. So these were very large parts. Um, and, you know, with large parts, when you're printing them, uh, you end up with a lot of residual stress. So there was definitely some trial and error on our part to um, dial in the fit and tolerances of you know, specifically the rotational hardware and how it fit into the engine housing, um, because we did see a little bit of warpage or uh, distortion from those residual stresses, uh, but we were able to overcome it with, you know, kind of a little trial, trial and error method, I guess. You know, we printed a few samples and then um, made some adjustments from there and eventually were able to dial in uh, and, I guess, control those residual stresses. Uh, we do do a stress relief process on the printed parts, so that, that helps. Um, but yeah, the residual stress definitely has an impact. Thank you. This next question is from ES3. Castings are a long lead item, but would you agree that die forgings are also a long lead item and potentially the same as castings? Uh, I'll Mike, take that one, Kelsey. On yeah, I, I don't disagree with you at all. Uh, we didn't have any... Uh, forgings in, in our engine we were really comparing to and castings turned out to be the one that, that we focused on. But you're right, I don't disagree. Great. Um, this next question is from Pyrogenesis Canada, Inc. In the, in the 3D printing, like for the titanium components, if any, which size or cut of the powders you use in these specific engines? Um, oh, I, I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question and I apologize to whoever asked that one. Um, again, this was a nickel alloy uh, material that we used mostly for these parts. Um, so no titanium. Uh, I can tell you, I think they're asking about the particle size of the AM powder. Um, I don't recall the powder supplier off the top of my head, but I can tell you that we weren't using anything special here. We were, um, you know, buying our powder from a um, an AM powder producer that anybody could go out and purchase powder from. That we weren't uh, requesting any special, you know, characteristics from the powder from our supplier. So uh, we weren't using anything unique or different. And I believe if you're curious about like the powder and the powder particle sizes you can find most of that published um, from different powder producers on their websites. So that's readily available out on the web. What about reuse, Kelsey, of powder, print to print? Yeah, so we, we do, um, for those familiar with Metal AM, you can, um, you know, any powder that doesn't get centered during the print printing process can then be uh, filtered and then uh, mixed back in with fresh powder to be reused for future prints. Um, we did use a lot of high reuse powder. Um, we test all of our powders. Uh, we do chemistry and flow and then tensile testing on all of our powders to ensure that reuse of powders is not detrimental to the material properties. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do use reuse powder for the printing of our components up to a certain amount before we um, determine that the powder is no longer uh, useful. 
Great. We, we still have a lot of questions. I want to try and squeeze in two before we jump on to the next set of speakers, and then we'll come back and answer any towards the um, end of the webinar. This, this next one is from Hydrokinetic Energy Corporation. Do you have a comparison of labor um, for the two manufacturing methods? Mike, you want to jump on that one again? Yeah, I'd... Uh... I'd have to go back and, and pull out the data. Um, I don't think we, I, I don't I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry, maybe uh, we could talk later. Okay, um, uh, I'll make the questions available to you. Uh, I suspect this has to do with a, not just a cost comparison, but, but perhaps a labor comparison for the right. two manufacturing methods. All right, right. this uh, last question is from Floor. How do the economics of AM scale for microturbines? And is the DOD considering this for continuing production or just for prototyping and small runs? Okay, I, I'll try to answer that. I would say that there's always a, a, a level at which you get to where you have the time and it makes sense to go back into a more traditional way of doing it. For instance, if you could perfect a casting mold and knock them out very quickly, that uh, at high volumes, it would make sense to stay with the casting, for instance. But when you're trying to develop something and you're trying to get through all the iterations to get it optimized, or if you're trying to uh, get to the point where you have time to develop a more traditional approach for the high volume, that's where AM comes in and helps. So I think there's no pure answer to this that says, well, sometimes it's you do it one way and sometimes you do it the other. It depends on the complexity of the part, the capabilities of AM versus the design needs and certainly the lead time. I hope that halfway answers your question. Thank you. Kelsey, would you like to add something or should we go ahead and transition to the next set of speakers? Uh, no, I'm good, Rula. Thank you, though. Great. Well, thank you both for a great presentation and engaging um, Q&A session. And at this point, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next two speakers, Dr. Deren Apalian from the University of California at Irvine and Dr. J.U. Liang um, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Dr. Apelian is a distinguished professor of material, uh, material science and engineering at UCI. He also serves as the strategy officer for the School of Engineering and as the director for the Advanced Casting Research Center. Uh, Diran is also provost emeritus um, at WPI. He is the recipient of numerous honors and awards and has over 700 publications and 21 patents. He received a bachelor's degree from Drexel University and a doctoral degree um, from MIT. Um, Dr. J.U. Lian is a professor of uh, mechanical and materials engineering at WPI and director of the materials and manufacturing engineering program. She has affiliated appointments in fire protection engineering, civil and environmental engineering, and chemical engineering at WPI. And her career has included positions at, as guest researcher at the Army Research Lab and as visiting professor at Brown University. Dr. Lian received a bachelor's degree from Central South University in China, a master's degree also from Central South University, and a doctoral degree from Brown University. Um, Diran, would you like to please go ahead and get us started with the second presentation? First of all, thank you, Rula, for all of the prep work and the intros. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, uh, depending where you are. It's a pleasure for both of us to be here. A very quick intro. I will first give a quick overview of this project and essentially why we're doing it. Why did we do it? Uh, and the impact uh, of the work that has been carried out. As Rula said, I, I used to be at WPI and transferred over here at uh, University of California, but we decided to continue to work at WPI. It didn't make sense to bring it back and forth. So my role here is really to set up the overview 
And what I'd like to say is that if you think about the Department of Defense, uh, uh, let me go to the next slide. Think about the Department of Defense. It has a need, a major need to develop a process, a manufacturing process, enabling making, manufacturing, repairing uh, replacement parts. Uh, uh, as I said, either making it, repairing it, but where? In the field, right there in the field, using locally sourced materials. And this includes, of course, waste materials and waste metals, of which there is an abundant amount of in the field. The uh, research that has been conducted by the Army Research ARL, Army Research Laboratory, has shown that ferrous waste makes up the majority, almost over 60% of all waste metals produced in the forward operating basis. However, currently the disposal of the solid waste generated by the base is quite dependent on the duration of the base, uh, the security situation, the ability and willingness of local infrastructure to help handle these wastes. So there's a need here how to take this waste, but more importantly, enabling on, in the field to be able to make components and repair them as well. So. In, in a nutshell, the, go, the goal of this project uh, has been from the onset to develop an agile manufacturing capability that uses waste steel to manufacture useful parts uh, on forward operating basis. So in this process, uh, 3D printing of polymers and casting of metals has been integrated into a mobile foundry design to enable the agile manufacturing. So the key words is mobile foundry, the design, and agile manufacturing. Now, you can see here in this visual, uh, the visually what I've just talked about, starting with waste material, sorting, blending, melting it, uh, making it into an ingot, pencil bars, characterization, the main challenge, however, in recycling of waste metals, I'm, just, I'm going to go back to the very, very beginning, the starting material, is the complexity of the, of the starting material. It's not homogeneous, obviously. In a waste pile, there, there is typically a mixture of different alloys, different weights, each with different surface coatings. They can be organic or inorganic. It's, 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 it's a mess. So bearing the goal of a mobile foundry design in mind, we really had to start with understanding the DNA of this wasted metal at the forward operating basis. We needed to identify the, uh, essentially the chemistry and what is it we're starting with. And we used a portable optical emission spectrometer, uh, which is you know not very, it doesn't require much space low maintenance, and can characterize small or large size parts. What we did uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a summary here, created a database of all the waste metal pieces that uh, the Army Research Lab provided us from the, from the basis. And we created a, a, a very robust database, uh, including the dimension, weight, composition, et cetera, all the information that we could possibly store and mine this later on to blend, model, uh, and guide us the selection of the waste metals to be able to make new alloys. Essentially, once you have, you understand the uh, scrap metal, the waste metal, and you can blend it appropriately, you can come up with new alloys. So with that in mind, I'm gonna turn over here to Jan Yu, who's gonna, uh, take it on from here. We decided not to have segmentation, so it's one more cohesive to have one person go through the uh, experimental work and the results. Jan, you take it from here.
Is all okay, Jan Yu? Jan Yu, we're not able to hear you. Jan Yu, you, you may please be Please unmute yourself. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yes, yeah. great. Yeah, I was somehow not able to mute my uh, unmute myself. Um, now I don't. Okay, wait. Great. Well, sorry about that difficulty. And again, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, as Professor Appelling mentioned, uh, we created a blending model to select the waste pieces from the database that contains detailed information about each waste metal piece obtained from army bases. For every new alloy, there is a target composition range for each alloy element. We also integrated two important tools, the carbon equivalent that is the CE in here, in the model here, and the critical diameter that is the DI in the model here, in our blending model to ensure that not only the new alloys would comply with the chemical composition requirements, but also will provide the desirable mechanical properties. As we know, critical diameter is a tool developed by the steel industry to assess the steel composition's response to the heat treatment. And the carbon equivalent is used to provide guidance on welding process to avoid cracking. Then this whole table over here essentially shows one example of the output of the blending model that guide us to create carbon steel from waste pieces. Using this model, waste pieces were selected from the database. The suitable weight of each piece is actually prescribed by our model so that we can formulate the target new steel alloy. I would like to share the results from the remelts to create three new alloys from waste pieces for three demonstration parts that we um, set about to create. As we can see, so we have alloy one, alloy two, and alloy three for the three parts. As we can see, the chemical composition of the final products really comply very well with the required composition ranges, as well as the carbon equivalent and the critical diameter uh, requirements for all three products according to their engineering design. Our collaborating team in the Army Research Laboratory identified three demo parts for military applications and provided the design specifications of them. We used stereolithography printing to create polymer casting patterns. We used the two different printers and um, we realized that to use the stereolithography printed patterns for successful casting, um, it is really necessary to print those patterns in a hollow structure to avoid the cracking of the casting molds during the later burnout process. The hollow structure of the patterns can reduce the amount of material used and avoid the cracks in the ceramic shell that typically are caused by the polymer expansion during the burnout process while maintaining sufficient strengths of the patterns. So once those polymer patterns have been created, we use the Magma software to design and optimize the casting modes. This process creates a casting tree assembly for the casting process for each demo part. A cast tree, uh, uh, assembly really enables the casting of multiple parts simultaneously so that we can increase the productivity. The simulation process helps us to avoid the defects in the final cast parts, as we can see. Um, 
in the optimized design, the defects such as the hot spots and the porosities tend to be concentrated in the pouring basin or the sprue and not in the work pieces that we want to create later. We conducted optimization by simulation uh, for all three demo pieces. So once we have created the casting tree design and the polymer patterns have been printed accordingly, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I noticed the um, chat. I, I don't know why there is a black spot either. We're trying to work on it, Ju. Just okay. Come on and proceed until okay. we can figure out what's going on. Thank you. Perfect. For your okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, once we have created the casting tree design and having the polymer patterns printed accordingly and assembled accordingly, the next step was to make ceramic cast molds by coating the polymer patterns with ceramic slurry. The slurry coating was then dried to obtain a ceramic shell as the casting mold. An optimized recipe has been developed to coat the polymer casting trees and produce the ceramic cast molds. The ceramic shell was made by a six layer dipping and stucco process to ensure sufficient strains during burn out and the casting process. It is important for this recipe to provide good gas permeability to ensure complete burn out of um, the polymers and the escape of the gases during the casting process to avoid the defects. Um, the pictures um, that we're showing here on this slide um, is a polymer casting tree uh, with ceramic shell coating and the details of the ceramic shell coating. So um, the slide that I was referring to is showing on the screen now. Um, and the pictures here, um, again, uh, show a polymer casting tree uh, with the uh, uh, ceramic coating. Uh, and then the zoom in uh, here shows the detail of the ceramic shell coating. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So after the shell making, a burn out process was employed to uh, remove the polymer pattern. Um, we developed an optimized burn out schedule uh, you, with, to save time and energy while ensuring the complete burn out of the polymer patterns. Guided by the uh, thermography metric analysis, we have been able to reduce the total burnout time from over uh, 50 hours of the previously established routine to about uh, 37 hours. In this process, the slow ramping up rate in the first stage allows the materials to be heated up slowly, reducing the chance of cracking in the ceramic shell. Then the ceramic shell was heated to 155 degrees Celsius and held for three hours. At this temperature, the moisture in the shell was fully removed and the burn out uh, begins gently, breaking down the polymer patterns without uh, forceful expansion. Finally, um, the shell was heated up to 675 degrees C and held for another three hours. This step eliminates the remaining resin or um, casting wax in the investment. Uh, indeed, a uh, thermography metric analysis has shown us that both the VZJet castable resin and the Formlabs castable wax used in our two stereolithographic uh, printing processes completely decompose and burn out at the temperature of around 650 degrees Celsius. So after this stage, the ceramic shell was slowly cooled to the room temperature. Uh, 
Um, can we advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the waste metals selected by the blending model we discussed previously were melted using an induction furnace and the molten metal was poured into the ceramic casting tree after the burnout process we just discussed. Then the cast parts were cooled down to the room temperature. Um, due to rapid cooling in the investment casting process, the casted pieces must be heat treated to obtain the microstructure and the mechanical properties needed. After the heat treatment, the parts were sandblasted for the final surface finishing. Then um, the, the three pictures here actually show the three final demo parts made by this manufacturing process using waste steels uh, obtained from the army bases. We further characterize the, the key dimensions of the final cast parts um, and summarize them in here. The results clearly show that all the key dimensions of the final products with, were within the required tolerance. Um, in this work, we also used the hardness as the main indicator of the mechanical properties of the created demo parts. We were able to use the hardness as the main indicator of the mechanical properties of the uh, demo parts because through our collaboration with the Steel Founders Society of America, we had access to over 30,000 data engines collected from many foundries all over the country in a few decades. Using this large database, we conducted an extensive study which resulted in a PhD dissertation to validate and improve the correlation between hardness and other mechanical properties such as automated tensile strength and yield strength. Our published work showed that hardness has a linear correlation with other mechanical properties and can be used to calculate other mechanical properties with confidence. The example here shows the correlation between the hardness and the automated tensile strength in steel. Since hardness measurement is the easiest mechanical property measurement to be conducted and integrated into a mobile foundry, hardness measurement has been used as the main characterization of the products in the mobile foundry. The picture here actually shows the setup of the compact casting system in our foundry at the university. The amount of the metal that can be casted is limited by the capacity of the induction melting furnace in the setup. All the demo parts were created from waste metals using this compact foundry setup. With the successful demonstration of the process, when uh, moved on to creating a mobile foundry design that can be housed by standard shipping containers. To design the mobile foundry, we used the X lab that was previously deployed by the Department of Defense um, as an example and designed our mobile foundry to be complementary to the X lab. We aimed at integrating all equipment and the facilities uh, into this mobile foundry design. The design currently consists of three standard size uh, shipping containers of the size of 20 feet by eight feet by 8.5 feet. The first container is used for um, pattern printing, um, ceramic shell making and material um, storage. So then the second container in the middle is used to accommodate all the melting and the pouring equipment throughout the process and therefore um, includes uh, an induction furnace in the center, a box furnace, personal protection equipment, and a ventilation system. Then the third container uh, was used for characterization and the final product inspection, uh, which actually also includes uh, a CT setup, CT scanner. A 3D model of the mobile foundry container was created using Fusion 360 software to provide a better visualization of the mobile foundry design. 
to ensure a safe and comfortable operating environment, um, thermal simulations have been conducted using ANSYS uh, software. In the mobile foundry system, the main heating sources are the box furnace for the ceramic shell burnout and the preheating, and the induction furnace for remelting. Temperatures at the different locations during operation, including melting and pouring actions, have been measured and documented. Thermal simulation has been conducted using this measurement data for different scenarios. With the ventilation system, the maximum temperature in typical operating areas within the mobile foundry was shown to be 26 degrees Celsius in different simulation scenarios, which is a comfortable and a reasonable um, situation for indoor uh, foundry working environment. We conducted research to identify and ensure the appropriate power source for the mobile foundry. It was found that microgrid systems can provide sufficient power for the mobile foundry power requirements. One example here is the box powers solar container. This commercially available microgrid power system can be housed by a standard shipping container and can sufficiently power the operation of our mobile foundry uh, in the previous design. To equip which, uh, our containers uh, with appropriate instruments and supplies, the team also conducted research on currently available equipment in the market and selected the suitable options based on safety, size, power and cooling demands, uh, easy of operation and technology maturity. Um, the possible options for required equipment in the mobile foundry system are summarized here with links to the websites of the suppliers uh, whenever possible. We also summarized the personal protection equipment needed for the mobile foundry operation. So um, in summary, this project established effective sorting, chemical composition monitoring, and the composition adjustment process to produce new alloys from metal wastes that are generated at the forward operating basis. This process is necessary to enable quality control of new alloy made from waste materials. We also established the polymers 3D printing enabled casting process using the remelted steel waste as the cast material and successfully demonstrated the manufacturing of parts for military applications. We designed a compact and safe mobile foundry system to enable this agile manufacturing of useful parts from waste metals at the forward operating basis in collaboration with the Steel Founders Society of America. We also developed the data-driven models uh, to study relationship between mechanical properties as well as the uh, relationship between mechanical properties and the microstructures and the compositions of cast steel products that I didn't include in this presentation due to the time limit. For the benefits to the DOD, we consider this work um, to establish the mobile foundry system design that complements the X-Lab that has been previously deployed by the Department of Defense and provides agile manufacturing capability using waste metals. This work and its future implementation will contribute to reducing the military logic um, the military logistic tail and increased operational uh, readiness by enable um, un by enable on demand manufacturing at the point of use by using the waste materials as the study materials. I'm happy to say that our work has received the media coverage, including the professional magazine of um, modern casting uh, that actually generated much inquiry um, by the professionals in the casting uh, industry. Finally, um, 
this work actually is not just single-handedly done by me and the Professor Appellant. Um, we collaborated with a team. Um, so in addition to myself and the Professor Appellant, the project was also um, led by Professor Sison and Mishra at the WPI, Doctors Mike Williams and you uh, at the Army Research Laboratory, and Mr. De Sera, um at the Energy Research Company. Energy Research Company helped us evaluate and integrate characterization and composition monitoring techniques um, into the manufacturing process uh, for this process that is suitable uh, for mobile foundry design. Um, we also have trained postdocs, PhD students, master students, undergraduate students through this project. And I'm happy to say that now they're all serving uh, in the manufacturing industry uh, in this uh, country. So um, for additional information, um, please feel free to visit this link to our project's uh, final report. And please also feel free to reach out uh, to Professor Pelling or myself through email or phone with any of your questions. With that, I think we can move on to the question and answering uh, session. We, we've received a number of questions. We're gonna go ahead and get started with a question for you, JU. Um, can your work apply to other metals or is it limited to only ferrous? Um, yes, actually indeed. Uh, this work can be applied to steel materials as well as aluminum materials and uh, you know, other metals that can be um, that are suitable candidates for a casting process. Um, actually, since aluminum has a lower melting temperature, the whole manufacturing design and the setup can be directly used for um, you know, 3D printing enabled rapid casting of aluminum from wasting uh, aluminum as well. Um, of course, as we know for aluminum casting, degassing will be an important uh, consideration. So we probably also want to uh, integrate the setup for the degassing process uh, during the melting and the casting process into our uh, second container that uh, houses the melting and the casting actions. Great, thank you. This next question is from the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division. Um, on viewing the dimensional analysis on one of your slides, uh, did the printed parts meet the tolerances, tolerances specified? Um, actually, uh, in order for the final parts to meet the uh, designed, uh, you know, tolerance, um, we had to build in uh, shrinkage factors into the printed parts because during the casting and the rapid cooling, uh, the molten metal are going to you know shrink. Uh, so we have to build in the shrinkage factors to enable that. So the polymer patterns um, in terms of their design, uh, we have to build in those considerations. So they do not comply with the tolerance of the final products. But the final products, um, because we have built in those other factors uh, during the manufacturing process, uh, the final products comply with the tolerance requirements very nicely. Wonderful, thank you. Um, what limitations, if any, do you see in scaling this up? Um, yes, indeed, um, because we are trying to integrate the whole manufacturing process into uh, shipping containers, make them really mobile. Um, so mobile power source would be one of the limitations. Um, another limitation would be uh, available space in the shipping containers. Um, of course, the size of um, the building place of 3D printers that we are able to deploy in the field will also impose limitations on the size of the parts that we would be able to print. Um, and the size of the induction furnace that also ties into the um, power demand, uh, the larger the, uh, the um, crucible, then the more power you will need uh, in terms of the melting process. Um, 
and the size of the box furnace that we will be able to you know integrate into um, the shipping containers they would all contribute to uh, the limitations uh, on the scale up effort however i want to emphasize that this manufacturing process is not intended to replace all the large scale production that we already have Build, um, you know, in the industry, um, it is a very suitable process for um, producing replacement parts and the repair um, works from waste materials at the point of the need. So um, it meant to be a complementary um, to the existing um, large scale production process. Wonderful, that was an excellent response. Um, what alternative polymer 3D printing methods be besides um, stereolithography are suitable for creating cast patterns? Um, indeed, actually, um, in addition to the SLA, the stereolithography methods, um, both the selective laser centering and the fused uh, deposition modeling methods can be used to manufacture cast patterns. Um, for example, a company named uh, NovaCast, uh, they actually use the selective laser centering process to produce patterns for prototyping of cast components. Um, in addition, fused uh, deposition modeling has previously um, been approved, I believe, uh, to be deployed uh, to the fields by the Department of Defense, and they have been used to produce permanent patterns for sand casting. Great, thank you. T two more questions. Um, have come in. Do you believe that metal 3D printing is effective in meeting the DOD's needs as compared to the process you described today? Um, I really think that the metal 3D um, printing provides excellent agile manufacturing capabilities as well. Um, in fact, uh, I re read in the recent news that the uh, metal 3D printers were supplied to Ukraine by the Department of Defense through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative for the Ukraine soldiers and the engineers to manufacture and repair military uh, equipments in the field. Um, so I definitely believe that, you know, um, 3D printing is a very valuable and critical manufacturing capability to be deployed in the field. Um, however, if in, in order for 3D printing, at least the current uh, 3D printing technologies to utilize waste metals, uh, it also requires the remelt of the metals. Um, then after the remelt and the re-alloying of the metals, then make them into the powders and then print the powders into the parts. Um, so the remelting for the uh, casting process, the remelting we previously, um, which I don't show the number here, but we previously have done the uh, conducted research that shows that the remelting process actually costs about like 70% of the total energy demand for the whole rapid casting process. Um, so in that sense, uh, 3D printing um, using the waste metals as the sourcing material uh, would demand, you know, similar energy um, uh, 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 cost um, compared with the uh, casting process. Um, I do think that it is feasible uh, and will provide uh, capacities that are really complementary to each other for those two uh, manufacturing capabilities to enable um, the um, uh, under user to expand and enable, uh, you know, the capacity uh, manufacturing capacities at the point of the use. If Great, I could, thank you. I could jump in if I may. That was a very yes. rich question, the latter one. Uh, and it, what, what this work has shown is the feasibility and the potential of what one can do right there on the spot in the uh, in the base, you know, and in, in the, the soldiers right there with a metal that could be deemed as wasted metal 
and how to repair and to manufacture components. As Jianyu said, uh, what this work has done so far is looked at additive manufacturing with all the technologies that we use, but it has also shown the potential for taking waste metal and remelting it and uh, processes such as wire arc additive manufacturing type concepts where you have liquid metal that's being deposited uh, potentially in the two-phase range uh, because most of these are alloys, obviously they're not pure metals. It opens up a whole, a whole door, uh, a new door, on how to make things, not necessarily by the constraints and the boundaries that we have in our heads about laser powder bed fusion or some of the traditional additive manufacturing technologies, but rather how to deposit <clears throat> liquid metal in a small droplet in a local, uh, uh, you know, at a local uh, location, at a uh, specified location, and make the components that you want to make. So it just opens up the door to many, many other things. Hopefully that helps. Yes, thank you, Diran. All right, this next question is from VTG Defense. Is the waste aluminum collected useful for any purposes uh, at the sites? Um, well, if uh, I'm a little confused by this question, but uh, if it's specifically referring to um, through this manufacturing process that uh, we are developing, um, you know, to uh, definitely um, waste aluminum, uh, actually, when we get to the shipment of the waste metals uh, from uh, the Army Research Laboratory, uh, which they collected from the basis, um, we realized that we're looking at uh, many different uh, uh, alloys, including aluminum, titanium, and some others. Um, so um, because of aluminum's uh, low melting temperature and, uh, and the abundance, if we go back to the first uh, slide that Diran shown, we realized that the second largest uh, waste metal group generated by the uh, military forward operating basis is aluminum. Indeed, aluminum accounts for about 36% of the total uh, waste metals uh, generated in the basis. Um, this uh, mobile foundry design can be uh, readily uh, applied to um, make uh, to to make aluminum uh, parts from waste aluminum similarly um, uh, as what we have done with the steel, but at a lower temperature. Great. Well, again, uh, I, I'd like to thank you and Darren again for an engaging presentation. We're going to go ahead and wrap up our next webinar is in two weeks on Thursday, February 8th. The topic will be predicting climate risks to improve resilience at DOD facilities. Please visit the SORTUP and ESSB webinar webpage, uh, webpage to register for this and other webinars through the end of this year. As John mentioned, both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can please complete the survey, a very short survey, that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for joining us.